Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day three of the Red Hat Summit and theCUBE's live wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Rob Strache. Rob, we're talking a lot about AI this week. Securities, not, not, not as much but we're going to talk about it today. Absolutely, and I, I think it's very important that we do. And I, with one of my favorite people to interview as well, so I'm very, one very excited. One of your all-time yeah, faves, this, this, okay. This is very exciting. Well, I'm looking forward, it's my first time interviewing Vincent Danen, he is the Vice President of Product Security at Red Hat. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Thanks for having me on again. It, it would not be an open source community or Red Hat event if I wasn't talking to you about security and how we, how we, how we got here and what we need to look forward to. Because I, I think, again, it, security's not new to most people, but I think securing and what you need to do to secure things like AI is yeah. definitely a, a big challenge. And why don't, why don't we just kick it off there? Because if we don't talk about AI, we're going to get thrown off the internet <laughs> exactly. anyway. So, you know. People are going to yeah. turn the channel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but what, are, what, are, what should people be thinking about as they look forward? Because there's the AI supply chain, there's the software supply chain, there's all these different components that kind of come together yep. at AI. And you, in, in a lot of cases, you have the people's most important you know, companies and organizations' most important data there as well. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, there's a lot of similarities between AI and say, product security or the security of software, right? But then there's also this little thing we call safety around AI as well, right? And so, I don't know that we're necessarily looking at them both in the same way. So, you, when you think about the security around AI, you think about like the AI platforms, Right, and that's pretty well known. A platform, piece of software, we know how to do that. Security of the models, a lot of people are thinking about, you know, how do we prevent a lot of security issues, whether it's, you know, leakage of the, you know, data that's in the models and all these sorts of things. But what do we think about the, the safety part of things? Like, you, they're not a apples to apples kind of comparison. We have to look at them in separate ways. And even the way that we classify, say, severity of a safety issue in a model is not going to be the same as uh, severity in, in a product, right? So I think we have to really be thinking about a lot of those sorts of things and not just the proactive pieces, which I think a lot of people are thinking about. Like how do we you know, prevent prompt injections and data leakage and these sorts of things, but how do we respond when there is an issue? Like these models take a lot of time, effort, energy, GPUs to create, particularly the base models, you don't respond quickly when it takes you weeks to develop these things, right? So what does a response look like? I don't know that we know that yet. Yeah, I, I, I think to me that that's one of the, I, I would say, critical pieces because as you start to look at what organizations are doing and what they're putting into this, but to your yeah. point, even with Instruct Lab and what was discussed here, okay, I'm going to go in and fine tune my model. Now it's fine tuned, I may spend you know, days, weeks, doing that, making sure that that's safe. And I, I think one of the things, given that you're product security as well, I mean, it, in that viewpoint is where you get those pieces from matters. Yeah, the provenance. Yeah, the, yeah. so talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, I think when you're looking at a, a lot of the ways that these models are consuming all of this data from the internet, sometimes we just don't know where it's coming from. We know it came from somewhere out there, we don't precisely know where. And I think that there has to be a way to kind of categorize, not at large saying this model came from these you know, 100,000 websites, but like this piece of information came from this particular website. And then when you look at something like Instruct Lab, you should be able to make it go, and maybe not today, but talking about the future, I can blacklist certain pieces of information that maybe I don't agree with or maybe I don't like. And maybe a, a mechanism like Instruct Lab, having that information from the model can go, Give me information from these sources, but not from these sources, right? Because these models are so large. When it comes to the response side, I actually think that that's where Instruct Lab could be very beneficial because since we can't patch the large model, we can, because Instruct Lab goes with like, uh, I believe it's weekly updates, we could patch Instruct Lab to be able to, you know, remove some of this information that maybe we don't want. Um, and so I don't know that we have the potential there quite figured out but I see that potential in Instruct Lab to be able to do those sorts of things. Yeah. I'd love you to back up a little bit and talk about how you approach your, your job, actually, and, 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 and 
thinking about the balance that you need to strike between security and mitigation and, and worry, frankly, about the cyber threats that are looming versus also like innovation and, and getting, trying new things and being creative because I would imagine that there is a tension. Uh, there's a huge tension and it's, it's a very tricky balance to strike. Uh, we're in a climate right now where everybody wants everything fixed, right? And I always look at it as a, a company, Red Hat or anybody else, has a finite amount of resources. And when we're being asked to fix every single vulnerability, irrespective of severity, right, that takes a large chunk of those resources. If we carved off the things that maybe didn't matter so much or only dealt with them when they started to matter, kind of like when they're being exploited, all those resources could be saved to kind of focus on some of those proactive things. Ironically, uh, RSA is going on right now, and Jen Easterly from uh, CISA noted, you know, this whole secure by design, secure by default, we have to have all these resources doing all this proactive stuff up front. That's great, but where are these resources coming from? Right, because if there's a mandate to fix everything, taking all those resources, and now a mandate to do all this stuff up front, we have to be able to shift, which means we have to uh, go with that concept of acceptable risk, right? No different than crossing a street, riding your bike with or without a helmet, hopping on a plane to come to Denver. Like, we accept risk all the time. But in this particular place, we're stuck in like 25 years ago thinking of fix everything, which was easy to do 25 years ago when there's less than 1,000 CVs a year. And now we're, what, 29,000 CVs in a year? Like, it's just, the scale is incomprehensible. Right, and being asked to fix everything across the industry is really, really expensive. And precludes us from being able to do things like these proactive works or even some threat hunting like, um, you know, the whole XZ backdoor situation that just happened a few weeks ago. Like, we need people looking for those things because that's not the only, it's not the first time it's happened and it certainly isn't going to be the last. Yeah, no, I, I think that to me is really why I think it's important, A, to have you on here, because I think people are looking at this. We talked about uh, image mode, in, mm. in fact, and how you can, again, how do you harden an image and then yep. make sure that it, there's no drift. Are you, so, I mean, obviously, you get to see the stuff before it, it gets out and it's up on Git and all of that. How, how do you see that with organizations? Do you see them, because, when we talked about image mode, it was, hey, 50% still want to build their images, some of them want to use image mode. How do you see that for organizations and what, what do you think that, just based on what you have to do internally, what would be their best practice moving forward with the images and repos? And I mean, honestly, if you have somebody else building those things for you, that's work that you don't have to do, right? And then I think at that point, I could take a trusted resource Right, whether it's the image mode, UBI, or, or something else. Um, and then you just build on top of that. Now you have a, a trusted base. And then the responsibility there is, how do I keep my base updated? Right, so you, you need to continue following those updates because when we're putting out a, a patch, right, it's for a reason. We kind of expect people to uh, you know, apply those patches. And then you have to think about what are the things that you're layering on top of it, right? And then kind of, Look at that abstraction of what is my vendor providing and then what am I putting in there. I don't necessarily need to worry about what the vendor is providing as long as I continue to update, but I have to pay really close attention to the stuff that I'm putting inside of it because nobody's going to do that for me. Right, so now I have to pay attention to what's happening upstream, what are the things that I have to pull in, and depending on how much you're pulling in, that could be easy or it could be really, really challenging. I want to go back to something you were talking about earlier with this idea that companies, organizations are still stuck in this 25 years ago of thinking of fix everything. And I want to bring it back to the skills gap that we know exists, so we are in the middle of a labor shortage, in particularly in cybersecurity professionals. Yep. So I'm wondering how you, how you balance that and, and whether or not the cybersecurity professionals that are graduating today, how, what their mindset is, and then also how you go about fixing the mindset of of the cybersecurity professionals who were, who were raised in that 25 years ago thinking of, well, I got to fix this. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that comes down to um, regulatory expectations, right? So I, I think that today a lot of people are looking at security in terms of compliance, 
how do I comply to regulation? I'm, my auditor is telling me this, my regulator is telling me this, the government's telling me this. I have to do all these things. So it's, it's almost like a checkbox exercise. And you had mentioned drift and containers before, but we're drifting from that uh, security professionalism where it's like I'm looking for vulnerabilities, I'm, I know how to correct these vulnerabilities, and I'm looking at different types of attack vectors. And now we're kind of moving into like how many boxes can I tick and can I keep my auditor quiet? And I think that's a really dangerous place for us to be because for one, that leads to fix all the vulnerabilities because now I have a checklist and I have to go through it versus looking at these things and actually understanding what am I running, how is it being used, and is there actually a threat present here, right? And I think that we need more security professionals thinking about that so they can actually look at their estate and go, you know, these vulnerabilities, they're there, but they literally aren't exposed to anything. So does it matter if they're fixed or not? Probably not. And so I could safely ignore them, expend that time, effort, and energy on something else that's maybe more impactful. If you look at uh, the last couple years of uh, Verizon's data breach reports, right? They are consistently showing that software vulnerabilities leading to a data breach or a, neck, um, a compromise are like single digit events, right? When you're looking at the, the, uh, the sum total of why people are being exploited or compromised. The rest of them are all like human things. Like I'm, I'm clicking things in an email I shouldn't have, I have a weak password, I misconfigured something, right? Where's the technology to correct those things? Right, like automation, password strength checking, um, all of these sorts of things. And we've come a long way in a lot of ways from like uh, single user computers with, with simple passwords to you know, multi-user computers, multi-factor authentication, all of these security technologies, but not so much in the area of patching and actually a real risk analysis when it comes to the software that's installed and used and actually understanding that. and. I find that unfortunate because a little bit of understanding would save a lot of resources across the industry. Yeah, I, I think that that whole cognitive load that's put on security, just everybody in security and software development, and everybody says, well, shift left and blah, 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 and it's not as easy as that, right? I mean, I, it's I think. It's not. It, so when you look at it internally and you're, you're getting everybody to, you know, you talked about how it'd be great if everything was secure by design and you know, yep. right out of the gate, there's still legacy that's there and things that need to be. Do you see AI helping to play a role in that? I think it will, yeah. right? I, I think that, um, so some of the things that we're looking at in particular is how can I use AI to burden the load, or to lessen the load, or that toil, that say my product security engineers have to deal with, right? So if I can use AI and some tools to maybe generate vulnerability descriptions or do better assessments faster, uh, maybe describe vulnerabilities based on looking at a patch, like a lot of different things that could be done. I'm reducing the toil of my engineers. And when uh, you, you mentioned the cybersecurity shortage, there's the other phenomenon on side, on side of that is burnout. And just the, the amount of effort and work that people are having to do in a very fast moving security space, I mean, we're literally firefighters going from fire to fire, right? And so if I can reduce that toil by 20, 30, 40%, then I'm giving my people bandwidth, right, to be able to maybe look for some of the more proactive things which might be a little bit more energizing and exciting, right? Make them enjoy their jobs more and feel more, exactly. Absolutely, and, and feel like they're doing more than just you know, putting out dumpster fires all the time. They're actually making changes for the future that are beneficial for people, right? And that's the sort of thing that really drives us. Like, we want to make technology that is trusted by our customers and useful for industry at large, and just, I mean, helping people on this planet, right? And if we can figure out ways to do that, like figure out what security and AI means and all of these sort of forward-looking things, um, that juices us up like, like, like a lot. Right, so. Yeah, no, I, I think, it, again, it's one of these that there's so much that goes on in securing the software and all that layer, and I, I think it's, again, you see it in spades from <laughs> your position within Red Hat. Yep. I, I think it's one of these things that you, you can't be an afterthought, especially now. But to your point, you know, uh, everybody wants to say, well, zero trust is going to solve everything and all of this, and <laughs> no. what, what's, what's your, your, your thought on zero trust and MFA? Because you brought up the whole 
and if you go look at the MGM thing, and you know that was that was spear phishing through LinkedIn, and yep. you know all of that. So how how do you look at it from an approach? Because I, I don't think one technology will solve all, everything. It won't, right? And I mean, if you look at like the old adages, right? Like security is like an onion. It consists of multiple layers. Um, I mean, that that part that was true before is still true today, right? Like you have to use multiple technologies and multiple ways of addressing a threat. I think the balance that we have to strike is like you can spend an insane amount of money on all these technologies, but you got to figure out which ones work best for you, for your business, for your use cases, et cetera. But I think there's some fundamentals that are absolutely there, right? Like multi-factor authentication to me is absolute no-brainer, right? We should not rely on passwords exclusively. Uh, and if we do, we should be using something like a password manager that produces random passwords, Every single site has a different password, you know, short-lived tokens, like there's a number of different things that we could use as end users to secure our own experience. And then as, uh, as an enterprise or a business, like looking at things like, you know, the old firewalls, moving to like endpoint detections and intrusion detections and all of these different technologies. So at the end of the day, I think it's the response part that matters. Like you have to know that somebody got in and is doing something, you don't want them to stay resident, exfiltrate data, all of these things. Like you have to detect it and respond, and then so that's logging, that's monitoring, that's all of these sorts of things, and I think you have to have all of it in order to have a good holistic security experience. Last question, you had talked about what, what gets the juices flowing for your team. What gets your juices flowing when it comes to thinking about all, that's, all the innovations that you're seeing here, that you're in the middle of, yeah, what are you well, excited about? I mean, I'll start by saying I've been doing this for over 20 years. So I've seen a lot of change and shift. And I think AI is, pro I mean, it sounds a little redundant, but it, <laughs> I mean, it's one of the most exciting things because there's a lot of possibilities. And even when I'm looking at things like Instruct Lab, I'm looking at it going, how can I teach this thing to help my team, right? Um, and then like, how would we enable this technology in a way that's safe for end users and the companies to be able to accelerate what they're doing. I think security should be as hands off as possible, right? We should be using these things to uh, test updates, apply updates quicker, look at things like you know, Ansible for automation, like we should be really diving into that. So I see these shifts in technology that allow for that and I, I find that incredibly exciting. So. Excellent, well Vincent, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, a great conversation. Thank you for having me again. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretch. I stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise news and analysis. <laughs>